first, let me just uh, say this is work that has been going on slowly for a long time. We started about 2017 uh, in a tepid way. You, you'll see why. Uh, but now we're gaining steam as we get uh, more and more convinced that uh, this is uh, an, an interesting way forward. Uh, uh, but uh, it comes with caveat, and I'll, I'll describe what those are as we go along. So this, uh, a number of students have been part of this uh, work at different times. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll refer to more work as we, as we go along. So what's the motivation? Um, so the motivation comes from the, uh, the plethora of signals that are coming through, which are great and put us at, as a, at an advantage, at, at a vantage point where we can do uh, very uh, interesting, interesting tests of, gener of generativity. Um, and we also know from theory that there are many arguments pointing to considering extensions from GR. Uh, if you can take your pick, uh, either to resolve the singularity because you are not happy with uh, the concept of black hole entropy or how it comes about and, and, and its manifestation and probably its, its paradox comes, that comes in, uh, or maybe the concept of dark matter, dark energy makes you uncomfortable. All of them, in one way or another, are linked to uh, or resolutions to all of them or either any of them are, are linked to the potential uh, option of, uh, of modifying general activity one way or another. And of course, data is coming from regimes where we can test uh, not only strongly gravitating systems, but in, in the case of say LIGO sources, highly dynamical ones. Uh, so how do you go about looking for a theory that you don't know what it is? Um, uh, and especially, if you have very little guidance from, from theory, uh, the search is suboptimal. And eventually, even if you don't care about the search because you have a whopping signal that is strong enough to be caught in the detector, like even the first one, GW150914, was seen uh, without uh, the need of templates, but the analysis of what the physics content uh, would be incomplete without guidance. So there is, there is very strong reasons to try and consider some of these theories. But my goal here is not to advocate for or analyze any particular theory. I'll show a few, but just to motivate the kind of uh, nuisance terms or, or, or issues that one has to deal with uh, and how people are trying to plow forward one way or another. Uh, and so I rather will be discussing the uh, issues to bear in mind um, when consider potentially any extension, illustrate the issues that show, that show up, and, and as I said, one potential way through, forward, which comes in parallel to another one, uh, which I'll describe. And I think both are, are, are interesting ideas uh, and need to be looked at. Um, so of course, one pauses at even trying to get into this field. And for a long time, I was hesitant. And even today, I'm hesitant. Um, as why go beyond Einstein theory if we have so far no evidence whatsoever that it's, it's failing? Um, modular interpretations of, say, what you may want to call dark matter or dark energy. Um, uh, one is always in danger of trying to just in, simply invest, invent problems to solve because we can do it. Um, but on the other hand, there are strong theoretical motivations, even to entertain some potential uh, uh, extensions or departures from general activity that have a richer freedom. For instance, the full six propagating degrees of freedom potentially. Uh, available in a metric tensor of gravity. Um, consider potentially also how a robust cosmic censorship or the ultimate state conjecture, this conjecture by Israel that says that to occur, the ultimate state of collapse and merger is eventually a curved black hole. Uh, so to what degree those are also, or similar uh, concepts are also uh, arising in different theories. And one that is, always cool is the efficiency of mass to radiation conversion. We know in general activity for quasi-binary, quasi-circular um, mergers, there is an upper bound about 12% of mass to radiation conversion, which is huge, but maybe a different theory will have the ability to even tap more from, from uh, the energy budget of the system to convert it into radiation. I will, for, the, for uh, when, when needed, I might, distinguish a theory uh, under two terminology, and this is something that Franz Pretorius and I are, are fond of, uh, of, of uh, using. One is, we can call a theory interesting, 
a modified theory of gravity interesting if it is consistent with all the existing tests of general relativity in the weak field, but may offer observable differences in the strong field regime. We have examples like that, that people have written, uh, where particular solutions um, that are written under some very strong assumptions do differ from, say, for instance, in the case of black hole, from the black holes in GR. Um, maybe this, the spinning black hole is not curved. Maybe uh, there is no unique solution. You have a black hole with hair and, and things like that. But I will distinguish that uh, with viable modified gravitational theories. And that viable gravitational theory would be one that possesses a well-posed initial value formulation that can be solved to make concrete predictions to confront with data. And especially in this regime of strong uh, gravity uh, and very nonlinear interactions, um, the, uh, the tool we have to, to explore is numerical simulations. And numerics, as we all know, have a, have a way to making even well-defined problems a nightmare. Uh, so if we might have an, an interesting theory, which does not lend itself to well post initial value formulation, we're dead on arrival. Uh, so how, would, how do we go about uh, moving forward? So we, what, one, what one considers what modifications one might entertain, well, one either might modify the, couple, the coupling between matter and geometry, maybe to violate the weak or the strong equivalence principle, which are one one wants to go after, modify the left-hand side of the equation in some sense, just add further degrees of freedom, relaxing symmetries, uh, uh, consider further... Uh, uh, an ex extension or uh, that goes beyond just say the Ricci scalar or the Einstein tensor governing the left hand side, or modifying the right hand side, considering exotic alternatives to black holes and neutron stars, something that is modulated by potential other fields. But we have a strong anchors. We have generativity, we have black hole, we have uh, neutron stars, we have a whole bunch of observations already, in particular one that I, that is it, I alluded to before which it need not need a template to be discovered or be detected. And we also have a very potential tool that has been used time and again in physics, very successful, which is this one of effective field theory, uh, introducing kind of a Wilsonian view where one distinguishes short scales and big scales, and then somehow interrates these scales that shouldn't be playing a major role. And those come by effective corrections to uh, higher order operators. And so this is how Many of these theories that are extensions to generativity are motivated through an, uh, an EFT approach under some assumptions, and the assumptions will govern how complicated things are at the end of the day with respect to the equations of motion. I also, this is a field that somehow brings together a whole bunch of um, different branches of physics. And some branches of physics come with their own uh, tools, strong tools, and also strong preconceptions. So I'll just mention a few just to put us all in the same page, and in some sense, as we come together, this is the place where all folklore that is not strong, strongly footed, comes to die, and we need to, uh, and we need to uh, think very careful what we're going to do. The one is we have to be careful because uh, there is this concept of linearization stability that we have in a, a system of equations that the solution of the linearized equations is equivalent to the solution to the full problem in the linearized regime. For instance, if we take Navier-Stokes and we're thinking of a flow that is, say, a, a continuous, a constant flow, and we assume uh, the, um, we take the linearized uh, equations, well, we would have no decay. Turbulence doesn't exist in that problem. Uh, so that would be an example where it is not true that the solution to the linearized equations is equivalent to the solution to the full problem in the linearized regime. Maybe it is for a very short amount of time, but it's not that assumption is not going to hold true for, for a global evolution. In the case of these corrections a la, la Wilsonian, uh, one has the so-called regime of applicability where these higher order operators assume by, by construction that whatever corrections should stay small. And so we don't have the luxury of, of thinking they will stay small forever. In the case of kind of scattering problems in, in high energy physics, uh, where they only get to interact once and then we get the byproduct. That might be a safe uh, um, assumption in, in many applications. But in the case of a binary that is going around, the black holes are going around or binary stars are going around for a very, very long time, uh, effects can accumulate. And it's not clear that things will stay small. Or 
worse yet, they might stay small, but the secular effects might drive the ultimate behavior of the system. And our anchor, that is general activity, already tells, tells us, careful, we need to be very uh, wary uh, or very uh, aware of where we're going to be uh, applying our assumptions or, or which problems, because general activity has in store for us the stability of Minkowski. If we take flat space time and we uh, uh, modify or we perturb it very so slightly under some very strict criteria, we get Minkowski back in the future evolution. But at the same time, or in the other corner, we have the similarity theorems in general activity where if we have sufficiently strong uh, uh, focusing at some given in initial state, we're going to uh, invariably form a singularity. So why would we think that an effective field theory approach will be applicable if we know that that happens? Well, when we have a chance because we have dispersion in the theory. And so maybe the cases of interest are sufficiently dispersive that keep control, keep those extra corrections small, and we can go ahead. But we need a method a consistent way to try and, and understand which sort of initial data will allow us to do one thing or another. Perhaps overappreciated issues is kind of on the other, on the other side of this. Uh, there is cosmologists are typically fond of saying, well, we need second order equations because that will guarantee the lack of Ostrograsky's cost, and then we're good. Uh, and that's not enough. I mean, of course, if we have third order time derivatives, we'll have a problem. We don't know well how to plow, plow forward, but we can have perfectly good equations that are second order uh, where issues will arise, and I'll show examples of that. And then this reduction of order strategy that is used in S matrix calculations, where you say, well, the correction fit them perturbatively, solve the problem without the correction, and then use that as a source to evaluate, evaluate the correction and compute that, that slight shift in, in, the, in the spectra that will arise. It's not necessarily clear that that strategy will work in the case of, as I said, a, a system that interacts for a very, very, very long time till the merger takes place. So I give you the example of a theory that is interesting and viable. This is a theory that is second order, that is, uh, comes under the name of scatter tensor theories that were kind of developed by um, Esposito, Fares, Tamur, uh, and others earlier. Uh, and this is a case where the matter is coupled to the geometry through a, a metric or that is effectively rescaled by an additional scalar field. And this is both interesting and viable. The equations are very well defined. Um, uh, the, it introduces new physical effects. There's dipolar radiation potential from the system, and it does introduce some very clear uh, differences. But it depends on the value of the coupling, depends on how compact the star is for it to show uh, some uh, strong difference. And these are theories that are significantly uh, well constrained by, by, uh, by the current days. We want to go beyond this. And so before that, I, let, gonna, I want to write, because this is, this is uh, an institute of, sorry, of math. And so math, math if we're, oops, I'm not sure why it's writing there. It's writing, okay, I'm gonna try and do this here. Suppose we have this equation. That's our wave equation that we know and love. This is very good. Um, we're aware of, of, of pretty much everything we want about that one. Now, if we instead have, this is a linear equation, something like so, we know that now the, the velocity of propagation depends on the solution itself. It's not linear, but we still were, we're in pretty good control on that one. If we have an equation that now is the, 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 uh, I, I throw in here a derivative, Okay, now we're, we have to pause a little bit. This equation, we understand quite, quite, pretty well, but we know it's gonna deal lead with shocks and discontinuities. And once characteristics cross, we need to introduce another criteria to pick up a unique solution. And this is common, say, in, in hydrodynamics, and we know what to do there. But then if we have an equation that is of this type, we are, we are in a big question mark. I mean, we, our mathematicians will, will, will basically look at us, puzzle and say, why are you even considering this? And I'll tell you why we're considering this. And we could be in a worse scenario where we might have to be, or we might end up having to consider an equation of this four with three derivatives and maybe even much higher than that. And so what do we do there? Uh, and this is the, the, the challenge that we have ahead. So in some sense, 
what's interesting is like I'm doing the opposite of what pa Carlos was saying he was doing his talk. He had a system which he understood. He had a physics phenomena that is supposed to be there, but the scales are not allowed uh, to, are not available to represent it. And he was trying to come up with something that is not there uh, to somehow show up in the theory and in the solution. I'm gonna be doing the opposite. I'm gonna be trying to say there should be here, some things here that shouldn't be there, but they are there because the equations have it. They will be there because the numerics will trigger it and will continue to feed it. So how do we control it? And then ask the question, does it make sense to do it? So let me just tell you uh, a few examples. And with that, we're gonna build up our, our idea. So if you somehow say, I'm gonna use this effective field theory arguments, but I'm gonna assume, or we're, I'm gonna put for myself this condition that I'm gonna think of the most general theory that says has only one extra degrees of freedom, but it gives equations of motion that are only of second order type at most. What is the most general theory? You end up with this. This is something is called the Hordensky class of, of theories. And a sub, a class of this is the one I showed before, this color tensor, that I mentioned before, this color tensor theory. But in general, if you look at the most general one, it has all these things, which is a mess. And it, it was there for a long time. It's used, or has been used extensively in cosmology by linearizing the equations among uh, about a specific background, uh, Friedman, uh, Matthew Robinson Walker, and assuming linearization stability, uh, plenty has been done. Uh, with the linearized equation. But if you start thinking now the nonlinear regime, it's, a very, it's, it's very unclear. Some very interesting study uh, not too long ago by Papal and Riyadh show that by picking a special frame, they can show that even in that some very simple scenario where you, a whole bunch of these extra functions of the scalar field are set to zero, the problem generically would be ill posed. The counter argument immediately is to, is to say, well, maybe this analysis relies on a very particular gauge. Can this be regarded as too restrictive? Maybe in general, things are okay. And I'm not gonna show you much about this. You can go through a, a, even a simpler situation. You get a very complicated system of equations, but what I want to basically point out is the next slide. So in the next slide, you actually make a, a conformal transformation and you find out that the equations of motion for what would be the Einstein tensor is very fine. But the equations of motion for this, this extra scalar field is given by something that if we only had this piece, it would be the wave equation. But this now acquire a term like so, which has now a second derivative where kind of the speed of propagation is determined not only by the metric tensor, by the gradients of the field itself. So it became all the time quickly, very nonlinear. It can allow to shocks. Uh, and now one has a problem. Will this have a well-defined uh, evolution for the cases of uh, interest? And that's a question. Uh, but even before that, if, if shocks were the only, or, or, or crossing of characteristics, the only thing one should uh, worry about, one actually has a different question, a different problem. One can show that these uh, generically or sufficiently strong couplings or sufficiently high frequency in the initial data will not only uh, we'll have a worse problem, which is it will change character. It will cease to be hyperbolic. This, of course, depends on the initial data that one chooses, but one can only understand the system if one evol evolves this and then begins to kind of tell the difference of what types of initial data will give a, a fine evolution. And for weak data, one can prove even rigorously this will be just fine. But if the data were to have some higher frequency, things will be uh, problematic. And we, we remember in the back of our mind that we are gonna be doing this numerically and numerically we have a grid and the grid is continuously feeding uh, high frequency. So we are, we're playing with fire from the get go. And I can tell you, I'm gonna just promise this, uh, but you can choose even very simple setups where um, G4, G5, zero, you chase, choose a very simple uh, uh, interaction that is alive. And you can see that depending on the initial, depending on the, the shape of your initial profile where it has higher or smaller kind of frequency content and where it's higher or not also depends on the coupling, 
you actually run into this problem that the um, that the system changes character. You, the, the hyperbolic problem becomes elliptic, going through parabolic uh, in, in, in the middle, and there is no way to control this initial value uh, problem anymore. It went out the window. That's still not stopping people. Uh, in fact, uh, there is quite a bit of, of work that is done that, that is very interesting. So Kovacs and Real came out with a suitable gauge Going back to this question that people had, that, that can guarantee that for a subfamily, you will have a well posed initial boundary value problem that is local in time. At least locally, you, you can make sense of the system. But as soon as the evolution takes place and this extra field can grow for a little bit, uh, one doesn't know really what might happen. And uh, my colleague here at PI, with Justin Ripley, actually have evolved. Uh, this this theory it's a, in, in this particular case uh, case that is known as einstein dilaton gauss boneda and I think uh, Helvi Wittex talked about it yesterday, um, and they actually see that they can they can they can for sufficiently weak couple uh, coupling they can they can show orbit. So here is an example of the waveforms that are coming out from the system. Everything is actually well behaved. There is also waves associated to the scalar field uh, that is added to 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 the system, the scalar waves are taking energy away from the system, and as a result, the black holes merge slightly earlier than uh, as, as you increase that coupling. But if that coupling is sufficiently large, and that and large is not too crazily large, then what they find out is this break and this change of characters of the equation that begins first inside the, event, the, the apparent horizons uh, of the system, but as the coupling gets increased, they run from inside to the boundary and eventually kill the evolution. And now the question, the interesting question comes about, is that an artifact of uh, the gauge that is being used? It's an artifact of the, um, of, of the particular uh, yield behavior of these equations that we really don't know how to deal because these are equations of the type uh, that I mentioned before where you have Second derivatives multiplying second derivatives, which we don't have uh, good mathematical knowledge of how to do, deal with that. Or is it really telling us that this theory, even in its potential zoo of phenomenology, has the possibility of naked singularities? In order to be able to tell that, one should be able to have a strong argument to say one or the other one. This was not an artifact of numerics that is driven by the very high frequency of the solution that will be blowing up potentially. And it's the low, the long wavelength part of the solution that wants to go and generate this naked singularity that will eventually run into, uh, will, will be uh, potentially visible. So what we do need is a method that kind of tells us apart. So let me tell you a bit, a bit more and then what the idea is all about. So underlying all this is something like this. We think, or we would like to think, that it's an underlying gravitational theory of which we're trying to get hints of uh, from, uh, say, the data we're obtaining. We don't know what that, that underlying theory is, so we're working with a truncated theory, and I will, I will make an analogy very soon with something that we know much better. So we're, we will be working with a truncated theory. Every theory we write will be a truncation because we're not going to have infinite number of terms uh, all the way to what the resum theory should be. But somehow we want to come up with a work version that is free of all the problems that this truncated, truncated version has, but is still faithful to the underlying theory so that it will guide any answer we get out of it, it will get guide us to what this underlying theory is. So it seems like a tall order, and I think it is, uh, but I'll tell you what and how we want to go about it. So let me just quickly flash an example of how these effective field theories bring in uh, this graph. Imagine you have this action, which has two fields. And this, for simplicity, there are two scalar fields. They are coupled. So there's this term that knows about both of them. I'm going to throw in a potential out of it. This is an example of uh, Cliff Burgers and, and Williams at, uh, in a, a few years ago. So the field rho feels this potential. This mass can be large. And essentially, we'll be doing not much. It's just 
this dynamics will be severely constrained by having this potential that kind of clamps on it uh, its behavior. The field state, on the other hand, is a, is 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 free. It has it's massless. It can it can evolve. Uh, its dynamics will be much more interesting. So we can say, well, wait a minute. In this this raw field, we can iterate it out because it's not going to be doing much. And once you iterate out, you find what the solution is. You iterate it out. Then your initial action comes changes to this. And sorry, here I changed theta for phi in the next line, just so because it's, these are two different papers. Uh, this action, when you write down what the equations of motion is, well, they become becomes this one. To live in order in one over m is just a wave equation. But the next one has these pieces, and now we have again this this term here that was shown before, the second order multiplied by first gradients. But if you go to the next order, now you have much more complicated terms. You have uh, boxes multiplying by each other. Then you have a, a gradient of a box. And this becomes a mess. And if you actually want, I mean, it's, it takes two lines to say, to say this is going to be generically ill-posed if you go here, because you're going to have a mix of second and third derivatives and odd and even derivatives. And you're always invariable will find that some modes will blow away. So then we're done. Are we going to just throw this theory and, 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 and ignore it altogether? This is where we have to be careful with the statement. Well, we might not be interested in all the initial data. We're interested in some set of initial data where all these corrections are small. And we want to ask the question, will the natural evolution of the system be such that keep this term small or wants to run into uh, the UV side? So before, this is what the, before we go along, let's imagine that this is the task. We're trying to think generically, we're going to have equations that are of this type. So let's say for the metric tensor, and we have if we have extra degrees of freedom, the same applies to them. We have say the Ricci on one side, or could be the Einstein tensor. We're going to have some scale that is related to this uh, scale that we have in traded out, and we might have like second derivatives of the metric, which we have here, multiplied by first derivatives, or we might have second derivatives multiplied by each other, or we can have any arbitrary number of higher derivatives in the system. So we want to predict the behavior of the relevant systems, and we'll see if relevant systems are the ones we care to study, and obtain the observable dependence on this extra scale. As I said, our task is going to be complicated because we're in the nonlinear regime. We cannot artificially introduce, a, a, we cannot say uh, very easily how we're going to introduce a cutoff. If we say all the high frequencies are, are, are going to, uh, should be ignored. Um, and we have to be careful that any potential problem would likely be triggered by numerical noise. So whatever method we come up with to try and, and, and understand this, uh, it should lead to a consistent discretization and the ability to check faithfulness of the solution. Of course, as I said, this is a tall order and you might be sufficiently disgusted and said, I'm not gonna touch this with a 10 foot pole and I would be very happy to uh, second that, that feeling. But suppose somehow you want to uh, still plow ahead. So we might end up in a situation where, say we, we had control analyt analytical control of this problem. So we might discover there is some set of initial data, and I'm just putting this as in this yellow graph here, that has a very nice evolution. And then we could also identify this red piece here, which would have an, an impossible evolution. Again, thinking about general activity, and which this could be, the set of data that gave us Minkowski back, and this could be the set of data that uh, quickly or in a short time forms a singularity from the singularity theorems. The problem in numerics is that we never control 100% what our initial data is in general. Um, we might have a piece that, that leaks in and has a, a little bit of support there, and we keep feeding it through numerical discretization error. So we need a method that somehow will not allow this piece to contaminate what we really want to study and we want to understand how it goes about. Of course, we might have a system that naturally wants to go to the ultraviolet and eventually will end up here, but that's our task. We want to know what, what really will happen. So there are two techniques uh, that people are pursuing. One is borrowing these uh, ideas from particle physics, high energy physics calculation, that basically says, if, let's assume that the corrections will stay small. At the end of the talk, I will argue that maybe this is a very natural 
uh, argument or assumption for the problems we're trying to, uh, to solve. So you assume that the operations are small, stay small, and what you do is you first solve the background problem. So if you want, you solve the collision of two black holes in Einstein's theory for relativity, then use a solution, plug it in here to evaluate all that extra stuff that it had in there, uh, that will have this parameter lambda in front of it. And because it has higher derivatives, it will have smooth data. They should be small. And then you evaluate a correction. So this is a program that's being carried out by uh, Masha Konkova, Leo Stein, and collaborator. And they already have, uh, have been producing uh, with one iteration. Um, so this, the, the new solution is not back reacting on the space time, uh, but they are producing some approximate uh, solutions to the waveforms of for Einstein de la Tonga as well. The same theory showed before that Willis and Ripley has uh, uh, shown some results or have provided some results. And uh, more in, more, uh, in, in focus, the Einstein de la Tonga. Sharon Simons. If you don't know which either one it is, don't worry. There are two of the very, very, very many that are out there, but um, they are interesting. They have interesting features. Another one is to say, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to, let's imagine that that source here, I'm going to introduce a new equation and I'm going to drive that source. I'm going to the, the new variable. I'm going to use, introduce a new variable and give that variable an ad hoc evolution equation which will drive that variable to the source fully coupled. And my combined system is the system I want to study. When one does this, it's introduced a new scale, this scale of lambda. And if chosen appropriately, one can show or one can get a solution that is well behaved, the problems are dealt with. And what one is saying this scale is such that it's sufficiently high but above that scale, I'm going to kill the heck out of everything. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So first, let me tell you why I'm not doing the first, uh, uh, the first option. Uh, and my thinking is the following. Take Navier-Stokes. If you're going to assume the gradient stays small, then you're going to be throwing out the dissipation. But if I throw out the dissipation, what I have is a system that for all wavelengths is turbulent. And that makes me uncomfortable. Because now, whatever I do, my corrections should be such that that will fight against turbulence and give me back the laminar regime. The method I, uh, we chose to study also has a, a relation or a, an origin uh, very tied to uh, relativistic hydrodynamics. So for those of you uh, that don't know, let me just tell you a little bit about it. So we know of Navier-Stokes equations, if we uh, set the viscosity parameters to zero, we have a hyperbolic problem. When we turn on viscosity, we add to it a parabolic component, which basically tells us how energy of the, of the, of the fluid is being converted into heat, let's say. But then you say, well, let's take that equation and make the covariant form of it, because we want to use it in the relativistic regime. The moment you do that, that system becomes utterly sick. It can have propagation that is superluminal, um, and, and it's invariably uh, uh, bound to have frequencies that will have uh, arbitrarily fast growth. So the solution itself of that problem is ill, po or, or the problems, any problem you try to study with that will be generically ill posed from the get-go, unless you're studying specific cases, and then you realize that you could do something. And this is what Israel Stewart uh, in, uh, did some, some decades ago, where they say, wait a, wait a minute, my theory is such that I have the perfect fluid, say, plus gradient terms. Let's take those gradient terms and give to them an ad hoc prescription so such that those gradient terms are bound to stay controlled or are bound to, say, to stay subleading with respect to the contributions of the perfect fluid. Furthermore, if you are dealing with a situation where that, the physics of that, stays, uh, stays uh, faithful, um, then your, this ad hoc prescription is not really relevant. It's there to control the high frequency that otherwise will give you the stachyons or will give this unbound growth. But aside from that, it's not really messing up with your theory. And I'll, I'll have some comments at the end about this. But what we're doing is just taking a, a page or an inspiration of this and then applying it a, a, a lot more general. 
Um, so let me just, for the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, talk too more too much about this. This is an example only of using that uh, that equations I showed you before of this uh, scara field that had been iterated out, and you only had a, a one one equation of motion that, however, picked at higher orders uh, very nasty contributions or higher order contributions uh, of the derivative of the scar field. And here I'm just comparing that option one that I mentioned, where you evaluate the, so the solution and then use it to uh, add a source and reobtain the solution. I'm just showing that for sufficiently high scale, which are not too crazily high, uh, it's just stopped making sense not too long after the evolution uh, got started. However, if you do this change that I mentioned, we introduce this variable, which we are calling fixing the scheme, um, or parameters are not very well chosen, it, it just kind of messes up too much with the solution. It dissipates it too much in some sense. But if you chose it conveniently, then it gives you a solution that is very well behaved. And the problem I remember or I recall is that we started with an, an action that was a complete action. Then we did the, the iteration, iterating out of one of the variables and had this uh, simpler uh, single equation, but much more complicated. That's a luxury that we don't have in gravity. We don't have what the full theory is. We only have the effective field theory, or the effective approach with some of the truncation terms calculated. The other one is a luxury we don't, we don't have, but given that we have it in this case, we can compute the error as a solution and the, and the, the scheme does very well uh, in that situation. So let me just show you a few uh, applications and how we slowly have been gradually kind of convincing ourselves that this actually is, is a promising way to go. So one was take this, this equation, this theory, so it's, it's Einstein if you only had that, but you're also throwing all these terms in where these Cs are the square of the Riemann tensor. It's a, it's, it's a uh, contraction of the Riemann tensor with itself. So this gives you an equation of motion that is actually kind of messy. So this Einstein equation here will have secondary areas of the metric, but if you keep going, so this thing has secondary of the metric, secondary of the metric times secondary of the metric, and then it gives you terms that have, so now you have secondary derivative of the metric square times terms here that we have the fourth derivative of the metric and subleading derivative as well. So you need to be able to deal with it if you want to do that. And so this is a, the, a study that uh, Ramiro Cayuso did uh, uh, very recently and has been uh, published uh, in not, not too long ago, where he actually, in a very simple setup of spherical symmetry, where one asks to the scalar field to perturb the system, one studies what happens phenomenologically, and then at least try to get some messages out of what could happen uh, uh, in the physics of the system. So as the scalar field falls into the black hole, one thing we do is just increase this parameter lambda, which in this case is not, is, we call epsilon. And then you see that if the epsilon is zero, then you recover what you know from uh, general activity, which of course that should be the case. So the area, the, the horizon grows if, and asymptotes after the periods of accretion. As you increase that value, however, you have instances where kind of the qualitative features are very similar. You start with, with some state, you end up with a scenario state with higher mass and therefore also higher entropy. But there are instances here where the horizon does not really grow. It actually got smaller. Uh, so this is going very much against our intuition in general activity, and that's, that's natural. One of the reasons uh, that that happens is that see, as seen from the point of view for Einstein theory of relativity and thinking everything else as a source, what you have is an effective matter, if you want, that violates the null convergence condition or the, null, uh, the, weak, the, the conditions on on matter. Um, so the, 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 the metric tensor itself produces a source that violates the very tenets of the theorems that people have, uh, or the, 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 the peop what results people have noticed to come up with statements like the entropy of the black holes will be always be non-decreasing. Non in this case, in these theories, that need not, that need not pan out. You can also extract the question of most of the scalar field and you see that there are some small variations. And again, eventually you have uh, whatever generation 
very high up uh, of, of, of gravitational wave detectors, you might be able to pick them up. But again, this is just one theory. And so the way we, we take of it is this one example of how you can go about fixing these problems. A very interesting uh, application, which is interesting in more than one way, but one particular one, so two of the authors of this paper are in the audience, Miguel Besares and Carlos Valenzuela, is it went back to one of these cases in Kordensky, a particular called K dynamic, K essence, or K dynamics, whatever that's, it's just a name. It's an R way, an R problem where you do have these issues. And they have implemented this fixing. Not only they implemented this fixing, but they study, say, uh, gravitational collapse, and they see, or, or star oscillations, everything is fine there. But as the collapse, or they study collapse cases, they see that eventually um, there is a change of character of the equations, of the, the original equations, and they could no longer study the system. But through this fixing, they not only can they study without any problem, but they even take the, um, the extrapolation of this extra scale sent to infinity, if you want, or zero, depending on where you're considering the inverse or, or not of that scale. And they can see that indeed they can follow all the way to the extreme case where that scale has been thrown all the way to UV uh, and this, this, this solution can be obtained. And that more interesting is that this was a problem where or because of the gauge chosen and the setup that was considering was given them trouble, they fixed it using this idea. But then they were able to study in 3D the very same system with a different gauge and everything was done without needing to change this equation and the results are great. Let me give you three more examples which are puzzling because I, at some point, point I got crazy and said, well, how far can I push this? And I'll, and I'll show you three. So one is imagine just, just for the sake of, of, of the argument, this is very simple. You have the wave equation with this term, now fourth derivative. How will this technique work for you? Well, this is one example, introduce a new field. E, its constraint is that E happens to be the secondary to phi. I gave it a wave equation for E and a damping scale so that this thing forces E to become phi in some scale sigma. And I'll show you some examples. Another one is I take the parabolic equation, the heat equation, we all know that if we try to do this explicitly uh, in the numerical code, we have a grand, uh, condition that forces our delta time step to be strongly, uh, well, severely affected by the grid spacing. So it's second order, and so it's a sec second power, so it becomes expensive. Well, what could you do? Well, I can turn that into a, a, a coupling of two hyperbolic equations with the constraint. And I'll show you what the example, what the solution is. And the last one I'm going to give is uh, was motivated by Leo Stein and, and, and a collaborator whose name I have it listed in in, in, in this, uh, a couple of slides from now, where you take an, the equation for a soliton. Uh, so here is has a, a nonlinear interaction of a scalar field where you can have a soliton that is moving, but they throw in a second order term. So this is very weird. There's a you had a third order derivative as natural in, in your system, and they throw a second order derivative. And they use this uh, strategy where you solve for the background, which is a soliton that is translating, and then you use that to evaluate this term and then obtain a new solution. So I take that and I, so I add an extra field k. k is driven to the secondary of phi, and this shows up as just an extra term, a source there. So I'll show you the three examples. The first one is the, um, this one where I'm just looking at the value of E and the value of the secondary of phi. Don't, never mind the, the labels. Uh, and this is just for initial pulse that is thrown in there, let it evolve for, for some time. And you can see the tower haven't worked too hard in, in changing, uh, adjusting that uh, scale, but one field and the other one are, are following each other and, and quite well agreeing uh, with them. This is the heat equation uh, and you don't see a difference. So I have a hyperbolic problem and therefore I, I can afford a very uh, convenient uh, time stepper. The R one is the parabolic problem uh, written in the correct way. Uh, I have a much, much restricted uh, current condition and you cannot see the difference of the two solutions. And the last one is 
this uh, solution, this problem that uh, Galvez, Garcia, and Stein worked, uh, I'm not showing you the solution that they show. Well, let me just first show you the movie and then I'll tell you what I'm showing. So what you see here is in blue, is the solution done using the per this perturbative approach where you, you have the soliton, you evaluate the soliton to use the soliton to evaluate that right, the extra term thrown in the right-hand side and uh, you evolve it. Then on purple, you actually are seeing two lines, but one is hiding the other one. So in, there's almost a yellow you can make up at the end. One of them is the solution to the full problem because that's a problem that numerically you can actually solve for quite a while without any problem. And the other one is where the one you, you use this fixing idea. And so the problem with the blue is that it begins to lag. Uh, and so you, this, this is a, an example, or well, no, it's, it's to lead. Uh, so both it leads and it has a higher amplitude. And so that's an example of the secular effects are beginning to build up and significantly affecting the solution. Galvez, Garcia, and Stein introducing this very interesting paper, a renormalization group flow idea to then modify or remap this solution to get something that now is close to uh, the true solution. But using this method that we're pushing or we're suggesting, we didn't have to do anything. We just did what I, what I just told you. I chose a, a convenient uh, new uh, length scale and then the problem just goes on. And now, just for the last example, this is something that's being worked. I mean, this is a movie that Ramiro and uh, Cayuso came out uh, yesterday with. Uh, this is just starting. So Tiago Franca is still in, in, uh, in England and, and Ramiro working with, and Pau Figueres and myself are also involved. So this is going to this theory that I showed you already. So with the Lagrangian, is just the standard Lagrangian uh, contribution to for Einstein. But then you throw in the square of this, the Riemann uh, contracted with itself, the equations of motion are dismissed, and then you introduce a new variable, in this case, a very simplified variable, you just introduce a variable for this W, for this, which is, and W is, is exactly this, this is W. Uh, and so here I'll show you, this is a head-on collision of, of black holes. This is a very crappy movie. Only a few uh, frames have been saved, but it it's, it's just illustrates that you can mark these two black holes uh, collide. We did not have to solve for the background first and then evaluate it. Everything is being solved at, at, at unison. The scale for this new scale that we in, introduced has been picked kind of conveniently, but it, it, this was the first choice. And you can see there is slight uh, difference between so now, sorry for the notation. One C phase is say W, and the R one in red is the kind of the extra variable that is chosen to be driven to this C phase dynamically. The physical one is you take whatever solution the metric is giving you, and then you compute this Riemann square. Um, so without playing too hard, uh, you get something that can can be improved even further by choosing a, a more a better time scale or a better length scale, uh, but there is no problem whatsoever with the dynamics of the system. Uh, it's not blowing up in your head. But I have to kind of backtrack all that. See, it sounded too good. You're playing God when you're doing this. You're forcing the system to behave. And I don't know, when I was a kid, I, every now and then I was forced to behave because I didn't behave that well. And it wasn't, it wasn't a painless experience, I would say. So it would, you could force now this way, any system to no blow up in your head uh, numerically, but will it be giving you the right solution? And for that, you need to be careful. You need to prove or you need to convince yourself that there is no dependence on this extra scale, i.e. that you're dealing with a problem or with a system and you're dealing with a set of initial conditions where the where the system wants to stay mainly in the IR. The example, let me go back to the example of relativistic hydrodynamics. If you use the, the system I told you uh, uh, that Israel Thur modified to control the mathematical problem, if you use it in two plus one hydrodynamics, everything is fine. Two plus one, has, going back to Carlos' uh, talk, has turbulence, but turbulence in that case cascades primarily or makes energy cascade primarily inversely. 
So it goes to longer wavelengths. So you use this method, you study two-dimensional hydrodynamics, which we have done, and those terms come along for the ride. They are slowly changing. There is a little bit of, of effect in the solution, but by and large, they never get large, they never get strong, and they don't introduce significant uh, modification to the system. You take the very same system, and now you apply it in 3 plus 1. We know in 3 plus 1, now turbulence wants to cascade primarily to the UV. And then what you find is that after some short time, you're beginning to strongly affect the solution. That's is um, kind of graphic or is, is, is shown by a very strong dependence on this extra scale tau that I, I introduced. So at the bottom line is essentially the dispersive properties of the basic system. In our case, if GR wins over the corrections where they, they pull from these corrections towards short wave. So if, if GR wins to try to, take, to keep the energy mainly in the wavelengths that it had or longer, then you're going to be good. And the only thing you do is just make sure that the nuisance uh, uh, inconvenient uh, uh, feeding of high frequencies at the numerical level is controlled and you're not letting them just be carried away because this, the, the system, the, the equations of motion want to just blow up when you have, when you have those, uh, those modes. If, however, uh, this is not the case, that dispersive properties are not winning, well, then this is, wouldn't be the idea that I would, uh, that would suggest uh, is correct. Nevertheless, it's being used uh, routinely in quark gluon plasma studies in accelerators. So they just modify this tau, they obtain the solution for different values, and they see to what degree the, the main features of the solution can be trusted and for how long, and they extract uh, useful information out of it. And now, uh, kind of when, uh, just, I'm going to make a comment. I think both options that I described uh, should be explored because we are definitely exploring a territory where mathematics is not helping, or the mathematical theories of PDEs is not helping us because, in reality, we don't have any right to go there in some sense. But of course, we're physicists. We are we're much more uh, or, or or less reluctant to close our, our our eyes and try to do something in the meantime. So there is the first one where you just, or just in, in between quotes, where you use the background solution and correct it somehow. There are better, there are even uh, new ingredients where you can use this renormalization group ideas to then, in some sense, modify the solution, remap it to try and, and, and reduce the, the prevalence of secular effects over long time scales. There is this other option which I described which is fine as far as relieving you of the seeing your code crash because high frequencies fed through numerical noise will just take off. Um, but now you have to make sure you can justify it. And I, I told you how. And now I will tell you why I think you, we're, we're in good shape here. And there are several, several observations. One is nature already is showing us, at least in the collision of two black holes or the two objects that collided that gave rise to GW 150914. When you see the waveform, you don't see any significant uh, running towards the UV. You have a system that is driven in some sense that these objects are coming together. You have a, a, a larger amplitude through the merger, but the energy in the system primarily stays in the wavelengths that you're seeing. So it doesn't seem that whatever gravity is describing the system, that system is not trying to run. Uh, into the UV side. And, and that would be kind of a, uh, a ne necessary requirement for, or, or a, in some sense, a sufficient requirement for some of, for these ideas to at least have a chance of getting you to the right solution. There's also this connection with fluid gravity. So this, uh, there's a correspondence that one can show and rigorously prove in some contents. But if you're perturbing black holes in the context of anti sitter if the asymptotic equations in projected to at, at the boundary are just relativistic hydrodynamics, but it's relativistic hydrodynamics in one lower dimension. So what, we're intent, what this thing is saying, at least in that context, is relativistic hydrodynamics in two plus one is equivalent at, to the behavior of gravity in three plus one dimensions for black holes. And I already mentioned that two plus one hydrodynamics wants to cascade primarily to longer wavelengths, not 
shorter wavelength. And so then this, this, uh, this is hinting that perhaps gravity in general, as long as we're in three plus one, and as long as we're dealing with black holes, is such that uh, dispersive properties uh, will keep us safe, and those terms will be small correction. And so just to end, I think there is a way if you care, if you're interested in exploring this uh, potential extra uh, ex extensions of generativity, there is a way to make this connection. There is a way to fix or consider ways to ask questions to whatever you can write under the assumptions that you choose to uh, uh, construct potential modification of generativity and get some input on how the true underlying theory, which is the one you're trying to get answers from, and, and hopefully data will provide us with what we need, uh, uh, which is badly needed to eventually get to this, which is the ultimate, the ultimate place. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll close. Thank you very much.